Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us today to talk about climate education. I'm Emily Sumner and I'll be your host. Uh, before we dive into how climate education can help achieve many educational goals and objectives, I'm going to review just a few tips to help the webinar run smoothly for you. The GoToWebinar platform does not have a group chat, but we do welcome your questions and feedback. Um, we'll be holding a Q&A period at the end of the webinar, and you can send your questions in to me, and we'll put them into the queue to be answered during the, um, that Q&A session. Um, if you locate the Q&A icon at the bottom of your control panel, if you click on that, you'll be able to type your question. And like I said, I'll get it, and we'll uh, put it into the queue to be asked um, at the end. If you have any technical difficulties during the presentation, um, you can use that same Q&A feature uh, to send me a note, and I'll do my best to resolve the problem for you. One thing you can do right now to help everything go smoothly is to close all of the other applications on your machine, which I know is very hard to do, but if you close Word, PowerPoint, Acrobat, um, all of your internet browser tabs and just leave um, go to webinar open, uh, that just ensures all of your internet and um, computer bandwidth goes to power that application. And that can really smooth out any audio or video lags that you might experience. Um, if you do have audio or video lags that last more than a second or two, you might try logging out of GoToWebinar and coming right back in and that often resets the connection for you. We are recording today's webinar, so if you're not able to stay on for the whole presentation, that's okay. Um, we'll be sending the recording out by email tomorrow along with the slide deck and your certificate of attendance. Um, we'll also be posting um, the materials on the One Step um, website. So anyway, keep an eye out um, for your email tomorrow afternoon uh, for a link to access all of those materials. Okay, I think we are ready to get started and I am pleased to invite uh, Rhea May to join me on screen. Hi, welcome. How are you today? Hello, I'm fantastic, Emily. How are you? Great. It's good to see you, and we're excited to get started. Um, before we do, I'm just going to give a brief introduction to Rhea, uh, who is a science-focused educator, instructional leader, and lifelong learner. Uh, she's worked as a K-5 science teacher for a New York City-based um, large charter school net network for seven years. And in this role, she supported all of the network schools by helping to overhaul the science curriculum to better align it with NGSS. Um, today, Rhea is serving as an instructional coach for science teacher in New York City schools and as a curriculum writer for the new climate education curriculum, One Step. And when she's not working um, with those schools or trying out a new experience, um, experiment, um, she's often cuddling with her dog, Evie, and reading a science fiction book, which sounds like a great way to spend an afternoon or a Saturday. Um, so thanks for being here with us today, and I will go ahead and turn things over to you. Thank you so much, Emily, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm really happy to be here, and I hope that we will be able to go through some very inspiring things. Hopefully, we'll be able to talk about some things that will get the gears in your mind moving for how you can incorporate climate science into your curriculum, no matter what you teach. And I will put in a tiny disclaimer that my lovely dog that Emily mentioned I think she's okay. She's very happily at my feet right now, but if you hear any weird noises, that would be her. Um, so let's get to it. Let's talk about what we're going to discuss today. Just a brief overview of the webinar. We're going to start very broad about talking about the why. Why does this matter? Why should you be incorporating this? So we'll start with first the research that supports the importance of climate education to our students' future and a bigger picture of how climate education can naturally utilize how students learn best. After we kind of talk about that, we'll start to drill down a little bit more towards strategies, practical strategies that you can use to incorporate climate science across the curriculum and real life solutions through technology and innovation that reduce the impact of climate change. Finally, we want to leave you with something that can be very tangible and useful for you in your classroom. So we'll be sharing some resources that you can use today, right now to support climate education across the curriculum. So let's go ahead and get started of kind of this bigger picture. Why should climate change be taught across the curriculum? Well, large, big, big picture, the effects of climate change are being felt now. And it's on students' minds whether we're talking about it in the classroom or not. There was a huge new study that was led by researchers at the University of Bath in England. They surveyed about 10,000 teenagers and young adults asking, um, and it was a, across 10 countries, including the United States, asked them how they felt about climate change. 
almost 60% of students said that they felt very or extremely worried. And more than half said that they felt afraid, sad, anxious, angry, powerless, helpless, and or guilty. With um, this quote from former Seattle mayor, Mike McGinnis, really stuck out to me. And I think he really says it best. Students today are the first generation to feel the effects of the climate crisis and the last who can do something about it. Now, this high level of anxiety that students feel, it can cause paralysis and disengagement, or it can inspire action. What that specific action becomes, whether it's activism, education, developing the innovative solutions themselves, isn't our goal here. We're not trying to prescribe one specific action. What our goal is, is to pro provide the knowledge and the tools for students so they can funnel that feeling of anxiety towards productive action. So let's talk a little bit more about why it should be taught across the curriculum. Climate change education may very well be one of the keys to our collective future. Researchers have recently concluded analysis on a study that explored the long-term impact that an intensive one-year university course can have on an individual. And by that, I mean individual carbon emissions, individual choices. So what they did was they surveyed students about five years after taking the course or later. They found a significant increase in a report of pro-environmental decisions that they personally attributed to experiences gained in the course. This analysis demonstrates that if similar programs were applied at scale, the potential reductions in carbon emissions could be enormous. It could be of a similar magnitude to other large-scale mitigation strategies like solar rooftops or electric vehicles. Now, this is certainly not to argue that just climate education is the solution, right? Quite frankly, there is no one solution to the climate change crisis. But instead, it's to make the point that this is a very real and important part of the solution and investing in this really can move the needle. So now that we've kind of talked about this bigger window setting of why this is important, why this matters, let's kind of talk a little bit about how climate education really can, um, really can utilize how students learn best. You know, it's, it's very easy to write off climate change education as something the science teachers do. But truly, science education, sorry, but truly, climate change education can naturally utilize how students learn best, no matter what the subject is. So, no matter your subject area, it's generally agreed upon that students learn better when curriculum includes three different factors. Number one, that the curriculum is inquiry based, which means that the learning starts with uh, the posing of a question, a problem, or a scenario rather than just a teacher standing at the front and lecturing. The second thing is that it's experiential, and that's the idea of reflection on doing. So not just doing hands-on activities for the sake of it, but really incorporating that reflection piece so that that's the vehicle that students learn. And finally, no matter what the subject area, Students seem to learn best when it's situated in students' lived experiences and contexts. So no matter what your subject, this really is a great way and a re research-backed way to teach. So let's think through these factors in real curriculum examples. Um, if you would take a science curriculum example, there's a very big difference about teaching the idea of, this is what a conductor is, this is what an insulator is, memorize these definitions. Verse, instead of that, giving students a simple electrical circuit, letting them test materials, figure out which materials conduct electricity, which don't, and then start talking about that. Then at the end, you bring in, oh, what you figured out was these are conductors. That's what scientists call them. These are insulators. To take a non-science example, um, I, I am a science teacher, so I apologize. Those do, I can't help but give a few science examples. But you can think even bigger than that. You know, just the idea of in math class, teaching students the algorithm for division, maybe the way you learned, certainly the way I learned, versus this idea of giving students manipulatives, give them counting cubes, and asking them to figure out 
how to divide cookies among the class in a fair way. That's something that's very real to students and they are very interested in. Or if you're New York based like I am, one of the best ways to teach fractions is to talk about bacon, egg and cheeses. How many pieces are in a bacon, egg and cheese? You've just discovered what a half is. So this is really, no matter where you are, this is how students tend to learn best and how that learning sticks with them. Climate change education is a great way to utilize these strategies. So number one, students are noticing the effects of climate change now. So it's, it is squarely within their lived experiences. They're seeing that these things are happening, either as big as extreme weather events to as small as noticing littering and how that kind of affects the environment. You know, number two, students also have questions and have noticed problems in their world as a result of climate change, which is the basis of inquiry as we discussed earlier. And finally, we as educators, we can start from these questions and noticings that students have and facilitate this experiential learning. Students are invested in going through the process when it's experiential because it's also based on their lived experiences. So you can take an example for in social studies class. You could choose to either read a passage explaining the distribution of clothing factories throughout the world and implications, or you could take that same idea and give students a little homework project. Ask them to check the tags of their clothes to see where their clothing's made bring that in and map it out on a globe together and discuss trends. These are different ways to get to the same end goal. Well, it's the same way to get to the same end goal, but the strategies themselves matter in the stickiness of how students remember and experience the learning. So at this point, you may be with me in theory, but you might also likely be wondering, okay, well, how do I actually do this? How do I incorporate climate change into my curriculum in front of actual students actually every day? So we'll shift gears now from the larger why this is important and why it should be a priority to kind of strategies and then tactics of how to pull this off. So Education Weekly recently re released a special report focusing solely on teaching climate education today. No matter the subject, these are some top practical strategies for you to keep in mind as an educator. First and foremost, teachers must provide emotional support and the space for students to process their feelings on the effects of climate change they're already noticing. You know, in particular, I see this as one area where humanities teachers can really shine. This is the basis of entire lessons, understanding feelings. And it can be incorporating this into your lesson can be as simple as asking students after seeing a picture, how does this make you feel? Or after you see a graph showing how the climate is changing um, or the local effects. And also number two, teachers should also focus on the local. This strategy actually helps in multiple ways from multiple different angles. Number one, the topic of this local fits perfectly into the existing frameworks of how students learn best. Number two, focusing on the local is naturally engaging. That's where students are. That's where they live every day of their life. And that natural engagement helps kind of create that stamina that students need to go through the reflection required of experiential learning. One really wonderful example of this that I found was shared in the Brookings Institution report. It details how in Spain, there were kindergartners in a design for change program. They noticed that there was a problem with littering in a local park. So they decided to install recycling and trash receptacles at child level height to address it with their students. Now, finally, this is helpful because teachers have a very real concern about being perceived as too political in the classroom, especially depending on the community that you're in. A focus on the local kind of alleviates that, some, that pressure because you're focused on making your own community better. It's not about these big terms that can create inflammation. It is about your local community. So infusing climate change education in the curriculum certainly isn't going to happen overnight. And we recommend starting small. First in your classroom, then across maybe across a grade band, then to the school, all the way to the district level. So no matter where you are right now in that journey, 
choosing a relevant cross-curricular project theme is a great way to organize your efforts. What that theme will, will of course vary by community to community, but generally speaking, a good rule of thumb is for you to be focusing on either human impacts or biodiversity. And finally, it's really important to focus on solutions-based education. Now, this doesn't mean that we lie to students, but it does mean that we find developmentally appropriate ways to convey the message that, yes, evidence overwhelmingly shows that we humans are changing the planet, but also that every voice matters and there's still time left. Solutions-based education provides an opportunity for students to transform that anxiety that we talked about when it comes to climate change into some sort of action. Solutions-based education also, as we mentioned before, that can also alleviate um, concerns from teachers about becoming too political in class, especially when you couple that with focusing on your local community. Furthermore, solutions-based education provides an opportunity to demystify some of the terms and concepts that students have heard in the media and elsewhere in their lives and kind of gives them the context to understand it. So let's talk a little bit more about solutions-based approach. We're gonna walk through a few examples of ways to put these strategies into action, both in science and throughout the curriculum. So when we as adults think of solutions to climate change, many of us might immediately think of these large scale and also expensive green technology. Now this is certainly part of the solution, but there's much more to it. Depending on the age range of your students, this might be explored in your class, but just learning facts about green technology like solar panels doesn't provide many opportunities for real meaningful learning to occur. However, there are ways to teach these concepts that are developmentally appropriate and bring students into the design process. So what you see here are also solar panels, but they're also one company's solution to the problem that they have uncovered and as well as others, that solar cells are not quite as efficient as they could be. So this technology here is called the smart flower. It consists of up to 12 individual solar panel, panels that rotate to follow the direction of the sun throughout the day to maximize the amount of solar energy it produces. Let's take a look at it. All right, and give me just a second and I'll pull up that video. Solar energy solar just energy got smart. Imagine, imagine you can your home, your school, or business that is easy, efficient, efficient smart, smart, and beautiful. beautiful. That's smart flow. The, the fully integrated solar integrated system solar inspired, system inspired by, nature by nature that tracks the sun throughout the day throughout producing the day, clean, renewable, renewable energy. energy. Each morning, Each morning smart flower smart automatically flower unfolds when the sun rises and, sunrise and follows it at the perfect angle throughout the day. In the evening, as the sun sets, smart flower furls its panels and stows away for the night. But what makes Smart Flower so smart? Smart Flower generates up to 40% more energy output thanks to its innovative smart features. Smart Use, a fully integrated solar solution with simple installation. Smart Tracking, dual access tracking from sunrise to sunset. Smart Cleaning, solar modules clean themselves when opening and closing, up to 5% more efficient as a result. Smart Cooling, rear ventilated modules, up to 10% more efficient as a result. Smart Safety, automatically folds into a secure position until weather improves to prevent system damage. Smart Mobility, as easy to move as to install, so you can take it anywhere. Smart Flower has a wide range of applications from tourism to hospitality, agriculture, schools, government, and homes. Thank you, Emily. So, yeah, I mean, besides that just being a really cool and exciting innovation of itself, the Smart Flower is an example of biomimicry and a perfect way for students to experience the biomimicry design process. So biomimicry, it literally means copying nature. And this is actually a way of thinking and design that embraces this idea that all of nature, including humans, are basically trying to solve the same problems and that there's billions of years worth of evolutionary R&D, you could say, in nature, that we as humans, if we study it, 
we can use that and emulate it in our design. So instead of teaching facts and figures about solar panels, why not present students with the same problem that this company started with, inefficient solar panels, take the students to research how nature solves this problem to maximize solar energy intake, in this case, plants and particularly sunflowers, and then present this innovative solution to your students. Students can go through this process themselves by identifying a problem, researching how different organisms in nature solve that same problem, and then design a solution that mimics it. Let's go through another example. One of the biggest impacts of climate change is drought. Now, when we think of mitigating drought here in America, we might think of ways to save water if we're based in the West Coast, less frequent watering of the lawn, shorter showers, or maybe you're in different parts of the US like the East Coast and you don't think about it very much at all. Well, in places like Morocco, India, and other parts of Africa, drought has a much more disruptive impact in people's daily lives. Sometimes women and children have to walk over six miles a day to fetch water from dried up wells, carrying ju heavy jugs in the hot sun. Climate change impacts low wealth countries in very different ways than high wealth countries, especially women and children, when many of these same places have the smallest carbon footprint. They certainly didn't create the problem, but they are some of the first to deal with the impacts. So the question is, how do we approach this in a classroom that's both factually accurate and also incorporates these ideas of inquiry and a focus on solutions? So here's one way to potentially accomplish this with a focus specifically on drought in Morocco. So after learning about this problem of drought, students can be introduced to the nearby Atlas Mountains, which are frequently covered in a thick, dense fog. So how can this provide a solution to the drought problem for the Berber people of Morocco? Let's take a look. Porque hay algunos indicadores muy buenos Para saber si ese lugar es adecuado para, there are some eh, very comer. good indicators for the best site for a project to collect water from fog. For example, where moss gathers on rocks, or where you find lichen on plants. The cloud fissure opens up new perspectives for the Berbers. I couldn't believe it the first time I heard about the idea of fog harvesting. I started questioning the idea and imagining the processes. Ita Troutvine and the members of the Darcy Hamad team, including Mohammed and Hussein, installed a total of 31 cloud fissure on Mount Boutmetskida. This is now the world's largest fog collector site which provides 1,600 people with clean drinking water and has transformed their lives. Fog is driven by the wind through the close mesh of the cloud fissure nets. Tiny droplets of moisture are caught in the specially developed 3D mesh and then merge into larger drops, which fall into the catching trough. From there, the water flows into a system of pipes leading to the cisterns in the valley, 26 kilometers away. The precious resource is then distributed to the individual households. Each house is connected to the water supply. The Berber families now have a ready supply of drinking water, which they can also use to cultivate their vegetable gardens. <laughs> All right, so starting around third grade, students learn about this idea of the water cycle and specifically condensation. Um, if your elementary education was anything like mine, you may have read about the water cycle in a textbook. I have a very specific memory in fourth grade of reading this as a child and thinking, 
who cares? But it doesn't have to be that way. These fog nets are such an exciting innovation to show how people can use their knowledge of the water cycle to their advantage. Now, beyond the science side, this innovation provides water to 1,600 people and a school. Girls no longer have to spend hours a day fetching water. Instead, they now attend a STEM school specifically for girls. So exposing students to such solutions and how it changes the lives of people is a powerful way to inspire them. It gives them a glimpse of life in other parts of the world, to, helps them see the challenges as well as the hope that science and technology can bring. Our goal is to get students to see themselves as problem solvers and innovative thinkers of tomorrow, if not today. Now let's drill down into some subject specific strategies for incorporating climate change education. First, let's talk about visual arts. Now in visual arts, an important skill for artists is the ability to analyze meanings of pieces of art, including what makes visuals compelling. Um, in, you can incorporate climate education by studying what specific visuals are compelling. You could use a visual you see here on the screen, or you could use the famous don't or give a hoot, don't pollute campaign and create a visual about something that's important in your community. Now in social studies, topics typically revolve around how uh, humans shape their natural environment. You can take those existing topics and kind of alter them to include the effects of human activities. One way you could do this is the example of the tradition of controlled burns in indigenous communities, largely in the West, versus the effects when these controlled burns were eliminated and explore how escalating wildfires have affected human movement. In social studies, you can also, as older students, explore the legislative process through landmark environmental laws. Older students, excuse me, in ELA, climate change curriculum can naturally be incorporated when we focus on the specific skills we're trying to build in students, including critical thinking, writing, and speaking. Students can practice a, kind, um, a typical response to literature writing skills based on their learnings about climate change and or their feelings about climate change. That's building those writing skills. And the goal of climate change is to inspire action. And one particularly powerful action is persuasive writing. You can explore that through a response to literature or you can um, explore that through crafting letters, encouraging policy leaders to um, enact policy changes in your local community. And finally, like we see in Smart Flower, there are all sorts of really exciting technologies that are happening every day and more and more are coming out. But all smart technology and all new technology has costs and benefits. Debating these pros and cons in the classroom helps students organize their thinking and creates more informed opinions uh, around, about the world around them. Now, finally, Math. Math is deeply intertwined in the scientific process, and it's a great tool for, to help students understand climate change. En-ROADS is a completely free tool that was created uh, by the MIT Sloan Sustainability Initiative. It's made primarily for high school students and older to use to explore the impact of climate solutions. It is a completely free and um, manipulative, manipulatable manipulatable sim simulation that you can use for students to explore the interconnected interconnectedness of earth and human systems. And beyond just high school, beyond college, En-ROADS has actually been used by Congress and the US government in preparation for the Paris Climate Accords. One of the En-ROADS creators shared that many students come in thinking that individual solutions to climate change are by far the most important. But when they get to actually use this simulation, they kind of have those ideas challenged when they see the different impacts between individual and policy solutions. They see how far each choice can actually go. 
Now, beyond just En-ROADS, math can naturally be included in all of these cross-curricular project themes that we are kind of talking about. So let's take the example of wildfires that we were discussing earlier. In social studies, students can explore that history of controlled burns in indigenous communities. And in math, students can actually perform statistical analysis to measure tree density like foresters actually do to help understand the danger of potential wildfires in the future. Now, incorporating math into climate change isn't just for high school or older students. No matter what your students age, they have the capacity to notice change in their community. Maybe it's a low recycling rate in the school to a high littering rate or to increase natural disasters. Whatever they're noticing, how can you take that moment to create a natural opportunity to collect and then analyze that data? Now, finally, I couldn't leave you without some very practical um, pieces that can help you in your classroom tomorrow. I wanna make sure that you have something that you can actionably do if you're inspired to do so. So um, here are some very, very uh, great resources for you. Climate.gov is a great resource. It includes guides for teaching about climate and energy. It has lots of up-to-date graphs on many indicators of climate change. And the collection of Climate Literacy and Energy Awareness Network, which is CLEAN, Educational Resources, is a huge collection of 700 plus free, ready to use, rigorously reviewed resources by educators in science. This goes all the way from little video clips to activities to full curriculum units. This is uh, the clean educational resources are mostly suitable secondary through higher education. NASA also provides some fantastic educator and student friendly resources for a wide variety of ages. They have articles, videos, simulations of climate change, effects and solutions from the individual to the policy level. There are educator resources that are, include high quality lesson plans, and there is a, an, its own separate website, Climate Kids, which is made specifically for an, a younger audience, temp, typically upper elementary school through middle school. On Climate Kids, they provide games, interactives, and clear explanation to these highest level questions around climate change. Things like, what is carbon? Why is climate important? Finally, NOAA provides free high quality lesson plans for K through 12 climate change with more of a focus on the ocean and atmosphere. And finally, One Step. One Step is a video based climate curriculum. Where, um, and I would love to invite Lori Hill to tell us more about One Step. Hi, Lori. Hi, Rhea. Thanks so much. It's great to be with everyone. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk about One Step. It is a video-based curriculum that focuses on real life solutions. Students learn about the technology behind innovations. Students meet the inventors, innovators, and passionate change makers who are spearheading climate solutions around the world. They see the positive impact these solutions are making on the environment and in the lives of people. The One Step videos explore green energy solutions such as hydropower. But what about solar roads? Is that really possible? What are the pros and cons? The videos look at new inventions such as ways to clean up ocean pollution. That machine on the right is called the interceptor because it intercepts the trash in the rivers before it even gets to the oceans. But we don't just leave it there. One Step's goal is to inspire students to think green, think sustainable, and think of how they can take small everyday steps. Across the globe, we look at ways people are innovating as a necessity to reduce pollution as well as create new industries to support their families. These eco boats in Cameroon are used for fishing as well as part of tourism. Can tomatoes grow in the deserts of the Middle East? 
Can degraded land be turned back to fertile soil? These are some of the questions we answer in one step. Every video creates opportunity for rich academic discussion. To support the videos, One Step provides teaching materials and lesson plans that promote rich class discussions about science, celebrates innovation and problem solving, empowers students to be real change makers, and gives them the knowledge and skills needed to be creative scientific thinkers. It also exposes students to different career opportunities in green and tech industries. It's NGSS aligned with five E lesson plans that help teachers integrate one step into those different subject areas. So of course, science, but also ELA, history, geography, humanities and math, activities, experiments, projects and crafts are all included to help deepen student learning. One Step is not just for the science classroom. It's designed to support a district or school-wide initiative for sustainability and climate education. It's designed to inspire and empower students to take action to live more sustainably. And I'm very pleased to say that we have just launched the beta test and are inviting you to join us to sign up to be a beta tester. It's just a 60-day commitment to use One Step in your classroom. Answer some questions about your experience. Let us know. You and your students will have access to all the videos, lessons, teaching resources, project ideas, and action tracking tools. Uh, I believe there's a link to the sign-up page in the chat. Is that correct, Emily? Yep, we're putting that in there. All right. Well, it was my pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lori, for giving us that quick little tour of One Step and um, giving us some background on that. And those videos we saw earlier um, that Rhea had shared, those were actually part of the One Step um, program and curriculum. Um, so that just gave you a little taste of the, the type of um, solutions and um, different types of topics that are covered in One Step. So again, we've put um, the link to um, the website, the One Step website into the chat so you can learn uh, more about it. And you can also um, reach out to Lori. We've put her email into the chat um, or you can go through the website and um, request a demo and conversation with Lori. That's the first step um, of signing up for the One Step 60 Day um, Beta. So we encourage everybody to, um, to do that. Um, that's a great opportunity that's being offered uh, to you as webinar participants. Um, I'm gonna invite uh, Rhea to come back on screen with me now, and we're gonna um, circle back around to some of the questions that came up earlier. Hello, hope you got a little break and some water. Get ready for this second half. <laughs> Great. Um, so, all right, we did get some questions and um, I'm going to start off with one that I know, um, unfortunately, is still top of so many people's minds these days, um, that we've had just so many disruptions to learning over the past three school years. Um, and there's so many studies and so much discussion amongst administrators and educators and parents um, around learning loss and the importance of, of making up for some of that time that was you know, lost, unfortunately, to remote learning. Um, that it just seems like climate education could be something that's just pushed to the side as unimportant and not essential to student learning. Um, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on that. Yeah, that's that's a very real thing that I know teachers across the country, across the world are really feeling and are really feeling inside of them. I mean, I would put in one small disclaimer first that I do think that it's really important that we in the education world kind of start reframing this deficit based idea of learning loss. Um, because just like students might have anxiety and that can slip into despair, teachers might start to feel that way too. This deficit-based thinking yeah. really can, um, it, it can be counterproductive sometimes. Um, but beyond that, it is still very real. Um, we can't ignore the fact there has been an incredible amount of disruptions to learning. And we have, this pandemic has showed us that we might not have full control over that. So the question is, where do we go from here? Now, unfortunately, I do not have a magic wand to wave away standardized testing. So that is far above my pay grade. So that pressure is still going to be there. And I, I feel you and I empathize with the teachers doing that. But 
we also as educators, we know the principles of how students learn best. When learning is real, it's relevant, it's relatable, and when students are active participants in making this meaning um, of the world around them. And students aren't going to be able to build that stamina required for meaningful learning unless they're invested in the content. So I would argue that one of the best strategies forward is to focus on the skills, right? The cross-curricular skills that students need to develop like critical thinking, being able to analyze data. So in that sense, climate change really is kind of the perfect opportunity to explore a topic that is relevant and it's meaningful to students. And it kind of builds in that stamina to beef up those skills as students that students need to be successful in the classroom and perhaps even more importantly in life as a successful person. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I do think that the remote learning, while it had so many hardships for so many people, it did give um, so many educators a chance to be creative. Um, just thinking of some of your own examples, but, you know, math lessons over Zoom that took place in the kitchen, you know, where you're you're talking about chocolate chips and chocolate chip cookies and learning fractions or, um, you know, sending kids out into the backyard and coming back in with leaves or, you know, whatever. So I think that, that um, the remote learning did provide some opportunity to do more of that experiential inquiry-based student-led kind of learning. And so, um, you know, catapulting that back into our in-person learning um, just fits really nicely with all you've described before and, and this climate education topic. So um, I think it's good. And, it, and again, with those disruptions and some of the, you know, again, not to do the deficit, but some of the, you know, um, behindness that we are, I think it's more important than ever to get students engaged and motivated to try to close some of those gaps as quickly as possible. If they're bored, never going to close those gaps. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's it's about the long term, right? Maybe yeah. you can like really as a teacher, like really get them to memorize these 20 definitions and they will get those on that test. But for what? That's the right. really just a larger idea of them being thinkers. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so I know one thing that uh, many folks on this call might be feeling um, if they're not science educators is that they just they don't have the background in some of the science um, language um, or or topics that may come up around climate education so um, you know everything you shared was super exciting but it may feel a little bit um, daunting <laughs> for some educators so do you have some um, suggestions for helping um, folks for schools districts and educators individually you know to develop some of that content knowledge and confidence to integrate these topics into their non-science classes yeah i absolutely want to acknowledge and honor that feeling of being kind of perhaps overwhelmed or um, reticent to start teaching this because you don't feel like you have the base pedagog pedagog pedagogical, there we go, knowledge. <laughs> <that you need. laughs> um, and I mean, I think that um, special report from Education Weekly that I referenced earlier, um, it found that this was one of the top concerns of teachers was um, their worry in bringing this up in the classroom. Now, from the bigger level, districts and schools can absolutely help alleviate this problem through providing professional development opportunities around climate education. Um, so any chance to advocate for that, I think, can absolutely move the needle forward. But teachers themselves, if they want something, they can uh, access guides that I had mentioned around climate change education, we actually, at One Step, we're actually in the process right now of starting to create some teacher-friendly guides for science teachers and non-science teachers alike. So stay tuned for that. I, I'm hoping <laughs> that will be very helpful. Um, Climate.gov and NASA in particular have some really comprehensive guides for teachers. So beyond those kind of tactics, I would also urge uh, teachers to kind of embrace this idea that it's okay to not have 100% of the answers 100% of the time, right? Like We are all humans, we are all learning. And modeling how learning is a lifelong process as a teacher can be a really powerful teaching moment. If you, a student asks a question and you don't know, that's okay to say, I'm not sure. Maybe you can just do some research right there together and find out the answer together. Yeah, let's figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, and it kind of it like it removes that idea that um, many students I think still hold that like their teachers are like 
the, the, the one answer of what everything is. And that's, you know, real life is messier than that. That's not true. There is no one that has all the answers. We're all just trying to figure it out. So I think that that can be a really powerful moment too. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent point um, of just being in the weeds and and figuring it out together um, is a powerful teaching moment. Um, and I think too, just you know, um, whether it's more at the school level or even just individual educators coming together, you know, in your in your PLCs, your professional learning communities, you know, taking taking some of those resources um, that Ray has shared and you know diving into them together and kind of talking about how can we. How can we do this together right what can i bring up in math that then you can bring up in ela that you know then we can come together and maybe have a project or something so i think it, that's a it's a good collaboration opportunity yeah. for educators too to dive into yeah. absolutely identifying that cross uh, curricular theme of like what do we want to do what are we noticing in our communities like human impact biodiversity that's a really great spot for you to start at and any subject area you can incorporate it yeah and students love that you know continuity throughout the day that like oh we're gonna go on now to the next class and keep up that discussion and do this next dive in on that topic so mm -hmm. um, I think that's another exciting <laughs> another exciting aspect of this um for teachers. absolutely so you touched on this briefly but um climate education climate science climate change to use that word um it can be controversial and it can you know hit some buttons for folks um so do you have some um suggestions for helping educators kind of navigate that and um you know perhaps be proactive with potentially discussions um with with families and communities um you know before diving into anything yeah i mean i i absolutely agree life is full of controversy and i would say that um based on the way things are today that's really not going to go away anytime yeah. soon um so i i do i do agree i think several of the strategies we discussed earlier in the webinar could be helpful you know especially including like a focus on the the local a focus on the solutions that can alleviate a lot of the issues um i think that letting parents and families know beforehand that hey this is what we're going to study can also help um, i think that also depends on your community you know your community best as teachers but even larger than that you know i kind of think that the idea of just letting the debate the controversy play out in the classroom can be powerful like mm -hmm. we can take the the most foundational idea of climate change right that climate change is caused by human activities now if there are if there are students in your classroom that aren't quite convinced about that instead of just shutting that down and like no 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 no, we don't say that no let, let's play it out you could ask students with opposing viewpoints or you could assign opposing viewpoint viewpoints to students and have them go research find mm -hmm. all the evidence that you possibly can that it is caused by human activities find all the evidence you possibly can that it is not caused by human activities that it's natural then you, we can all come together as a class discuss this the research that we found and let students come to an idea for themselves and a conclusion for themselves you know i think that also just larger picture not kind of approaching this as like this is what you must believe by the end of it it that kind of misses the larger point it's really about learning how to be a critical thinker here's what we know right now and let's talk about what that means um you know it's not really about teaching the right answer it's teaching them how to research analyze data and come to their own conclusions mm -hmm. and then talk about and write about those what they learn and what they believe in a you know effective and powerful way so yeah Absolutely. Lots and then You're talking up. about finding new research and then talking about how we what we've changed our mind on what we haven't changed our mind on it's yeah. it's a continual process yeah and i think just um going back to some of what uh lori shared about one step um you know it pre presenting these it, it's it's solutions these are things that people are just doing to better their communities like you said it, that the local so the eco boats um you know are because that community in Cameroon, there, there was plastic everywhere. There was plastic in their water. They couldn't fish. There's plastic on the streets. So they did something about it. Um, so um, that can, like you said, just bringing it back to that local, but 
you can look at that globally in those local communities, those things yeah, those it is. are doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a good, yes, it's such a good point to make. I'm sorry for cutting you off, but it's just such a good point to make. <laughs> yes, it, it's a focus on the local, but it's all the local communities around the world and what are they doing and kind of looking at it that way instead of just this overwhelming giant like this is what's happening in the world that that's really overwhelming but it really is all about like what have different communities done to solve their problems yeah and that can be so exciting i mean i i i love just learning and watching those videos it was exciting and then to give students the opportunities to think about well, what's a what's a problem you're seeing in your neighborhood and what what can we brainstorm to do about that um absolutely it's, it's exciting so you you touched on this in your earlier answer <laughs> um just about uh about the, the researching and the looking at opinions and thinking critically um so we've talked a lot about um climate education within the core subjects um but these other skills and i think media literacy is particularly one that has a great connection to climate education um so what ways do you see that climate education could be used to help students you know build those media literacy skills and those critical thinking skills yeah um absolutely in today's world media literacy in of itself is a very very big topic that really needs to be unpacked in the classroom um you know kind of in this era of information oversaturation disinformation you know building those critical thinking skills specifically around how trustworthy a source is i think is really really important that can be done in multiple ways but climate change education is a great way to attack that because I mean, you know, like all hot button topics, there are a ton of opinions that you can find anywhere the moment you open your phone from both trustworthy sources and untrustworthy sources alike. So um, I think that it's really, I would just add to my previous answer that it's really about also taking that time to learn about sources and how to kind of be discerning as a human that has a lot like, you know, the world's knowledge at their fingertips. Um, yeah. It, you know, it. we talked about um, how you can play out the idea, the controversy of if climate change is caused by human activities or not. You could incorporate media literacy right into that process. When students are researching, there could be a process of like, let's look at these sources, let's decide if they're trustworthy or not and what evidence we have that they are or aren't trustworthy. Um, I think that that could be a really great way to incorporate media literacy into all of this and just really helping to prepare students to, I mean, again, I'm gonna keep coming back to it because it's the ultimate goal of education is to be a happy citizen that is well-informed and can make their own informed decisions about their own lives. That's what it all comes down to. Yeah. And contributing to their communities in the in the ways that um, are important and, and relevant to them. So that's a piece. Um, at the very beginning, a long time ago, <laughs> you talked about how this topic can be kind of scary for some students, or you know, cause fear or cause anxiety. And I think that that ties in um, with social emotional skills and helping students, you know, develop those skills, those coping mechanisms, how to identify how they're feeling, work through that. And then other social emotional skills like the self-efficacy, the motivation. Um, so how do you see kind of climate education playing in that space and that social, social emotional learning space? Yeah, I think that they are very deeply intertwined. You know, uh, self-efficacy is kind of this idea that um, a person's belief that they have a, the capacity to achieve a goal and the motivation is when um, the motivation is your desire to actually do that. This I also ap um, apologize to the audience. I am an elementary school teacher through and through, so you might have already known all of that. My <laughs> husband would be like, "I get it. You don't have to keep explaining it to me." So I do apologize if I'm over explaining. Um, but you know, uh, coming back to the question, when students are exposed to these real life solutions and innovations, that's kind of getting an example of efficacy and the motivation. And it's going to build those skills within the students too. When they see other people making a real difference in their local communities, they can now envision themselves as being real drivers of change in their own communities, as innovators, as problem solvers, both within the realm of climate change and outside of it. 
um, when they practice going through this process of developing solutions like we discussed in biomimicry, um, they can build this motivation to sustain the process outside of the classroom. I think one of the biggest goals of science education, climate change education, especially as when students are younger, is to really instill that love and help them see themselves as the scientists, as, mm -hmm. or, you know, if it's outside of scientists, as the mathematicians, as the writers, so that they kind of build that, that stamina to achieve their goals. So I see them like very, very deeply intertwined. Yeah, yeah, and and in, it, it's empowering to them that absolutely. Yeah, I'm I'm doing these things. Um, so, um, so we've got just a little bit more time, and this is just a big question that I'm going to throw in here at the end. But you know, climate, as as you mentioned um, earlier, is inextricably linked in a lot of ways with equity. Um, you know, uh, in terms of the communities that are most impacted um, by climate change. And so, how can we center you know climate education in equity as as we're you know doing this learning? Yeah, um, I, I think that that's incredibly important for us to be thinking about um, as educators. You know, climate change is powerful when we're speaking about local communities, but it's also important to kind of take a step back and look that the world is a part of local communities and some communities have different um, different circumstances than other communities. We talked about earlier um, the Bear Bear people in Morocco that they are experiencing some of the like first and worst effects of climate change despite the fact that the country itself has one of the smallest carbon footprints compared to other high wealth nations um so i think that really diving in and looking at how climate change is affecting different local communities around the globe is a powerful tool to build empathy and understanding um, you can also look at examples that, that we talked about, the eco boats. That is a way of empowering your community yourself. Um, the community did that themselves. They um, decreased waste and they economically, I mean, beyond just the environment, they economically empowered the community by driving up transportate or driving up tourism and lowering transportation costs. Um, I think actually another way to effectively kind of center equity is to focus on the data first and then guide students through analyzing that data in the meaningful way. Um, anytime that I feel like that I don't know the best entry point, a good rule of thumb, at least in my personal experience, is to start with the data first and then talk about what that actually means. You know, um, you could look at those climate footprint prints that I was talking about. You know, who is creating the most global emissions now? Um, who was creating the most global emissions in the past? How was it changed? What are the effects of this? You know, is it fair for industrialized high wealth nations to tell developing nations to cut all the emissions now? Um, who is feeling the impacts of climate change? And um, who's feeling it first? How are they feeling it? There, I, I don't know if there's any one right answer here, but really just exploring these questions and letting students think through this process will also kind of build that skill of empathy and making sure that they also are considering equity in their decisions. Um, I did also recently run by a, it was the Harvard School for Public Health. They recently published this really comprehensive guide exploring why climate change affects some children's health health outcomes more than others and how to improve health equity. So I would also, if you're kind of looking for a tangible starting point for kind of broaching this subject of equity, I would highly recommend looking at that. Yeah, that sounds like a great resource. Um... And sadly, we were at the end of our time together. <laughs> this was such a great conversation and um, fun to um, to chat with you and learn about all these resources. Um, so we really appreciate your being here with us today and um, giving us so much to think about. And we appreciate all of the educators who joined us today. I know how very busy your schedules are. So we um, really thank you for taking the time out um, to be here and um, participate in this learning. Um, and just as a reminder, um, you are gonna get uh, an email tomorrow afternoon with a link to the recording, the slide deck, um, so you'll be able to access all the links that were in this um, deck. 
um, and you'll also get information about signing up to um, be the ones uh, be a one-step beta tester. Um, so keep an eye out for that. You can also feel free to reach out to Lori right now um, to schedule a meeting with her to get started with that beta test. Um, that information is in the chat. Um, going in there again right now. So, and also in that email, there will be um, your certificate of attendance. You'll want to scroll to the very bottom of the email, look for the big green button that says my certificate, click on it, and you'll download, uh, be able to download your certificate of attendance. Um, it can honestly take as much as five minutes to download. Um, some little blue circles will swirl around for a while. So just go do something else, come back, and I promise you that certificate will load and you can download the PDF. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Um, thanks so much, uh, Rhea and Lori, for being here with us. And um, we hope to um, be back with you soon and um, hope that you'll take an opportunity to um, try One Step. We think you'll love it. <laughs> All right, everybody, have a great afternoon.